Phanatopia Awakening is a new, very improved version of a Newgrounds Flash game that is currently available on the Nintendo Switch and is releasing on Steam on January 21st, 2021, aka today, for a price of $19.99, with eventual releases to the Xbox and PlayStation planned for the future. It's an action platformer with Metroidvania DNA, focusing on a combination of puzzle platforming, straightforward combat, with a couple of side items to help you take down various baddies. But before I begin my critical eye first impressions, this key was obtained from the publisher for the purposes of review. That won't change my opinion of the game in the end, but you should know that because of FTC guidelines, as well as the whole morals thing, you know? Now, it should be noted for my first impressions, I have about 16.9 hours recorded on Steam, but I would say that I played around 8-10 to 10 hours. I did leave the game on for a period of time, and I don't exactly remember how long that was. And for this review, if things are a little bit different than what you would expect, keep in mind that I am trying something a little bit different in this critical eye. More of a stream of consciousness, so that I can try to get a little bit more content on the channel on a more regular basis. Let me know if it works in the comments section below. Let me start off with this. Almost immediately, Phanatopia Awakening seems like a game destined to be on one of my overlooked games of the year list almost by design. There's a combination of reasons for that, but let me make it clear, Phanatopia Awakening is a great action platformer with metroidvania elements, but it has a series of features and design choices that may turn off certain players to its gameplay style in particular. It doesn't have that knockout feature that would get the game shared and force people to play with it, but the particular implementation of Zelda 2 like combat along with a reasonable presentation and story will mean that it is fun for many types of people which isn't necessary to be a great game and worthy of a purchase. It's just that it is one of those games that isn't going to catch the eye and hence you need to rely on reviewers and gameplay footage even if the trailer doesn't necessarily draw you in. You play as Gale, one of the older kids at a local orphanage in the countryside, who goes out one day to collect her fellow orphans for dinner. Unfortunately, after, you know, finding them, a big starship appears and, well, ends up abducting all the adults in the village. It's up to Gale as one of the older kids to find help and try to recover those villagers and probably save the world while doing it because, of course, she's the hero. This is an adventure type game, remember? The story is what you'd expect for a game like this, and truth be told, it doesn't do anything extraordinary on the story side of things. You actually don't get a lot of characterization of Gale herself. She's designed to be the stand-in character for you, but there are brief moments in the story where you come across someone you've seen before, and you tend to get a small glimpse of the character at that point. But really, it's all about the world and characters you run into, and there is a good variety of characters, people, and different situations that you'll come across. One of the game's big strengths is the fact that many of these small characters, even the most minor ones, do provide a good sense of how the world works, and adds a little bit more to the lore, places, and systems involved in the big world. What I also enjoyed was the fact that Gale felt like someone who was in the right place at the right time and not necessarily this big hero. The characters in the world would only react to Gale when they needed something and it was obvious that Gale needed something from them. Sadly, a lot of these types of hero stories, especially in the indie scene, feel too centered around the hero as things just sort of fall into place with it. It was nice to see, for example, that a leader of a village didn't really want anything to do with me until both of us had a reason to interact with each other and there was a benefit at that point. So yeah, some good writing overall 
and I did like a lot of the side stories and little characters that popped up here and there. I will say though that if you're expecting a game like Shantae here, where there's some characters to talk to here and there, but there's not a whole lot in the area, please be advised that there are characters everywhere here, especially in the main hubs. Like in one area here, there could be 50 plus characters with small things to say, and some of them are vitally important. Hell, some of them you may not even realize are important characters to make the plot go along, and yet you could easily miss them the first time you go through a town. I admit, the amount of sheer dialogue that you could go through will turn some people off, especially those who just want to get back to gameplay, because these stretches can go a good 20-30 minutes of no gameplay while you just go through the town trying to find what to do next. Now part of it is that you can find little side quests and hints to find upgrades with them. So there is really an incentive to explore this world, and let me be frank, Thanatopia Awakening definitely tries to allow you to explore and come back after finding certain tools in order to see more of the world and get some more of those upgrades. It's definitely one where you'll want to make notes to come back to places, but you'll be rewarded if you do remember and make notes on them. There's also a playfulness to a lot of the writing and the cutscenes using sound and music in ways that aren't necessarily comedy all the time, but always brought a smile to my face. Let me give an example of one of my favorite parts, the second boss fight right before it. It just sets the tone for what type of writing the game has and what type of game that you're going to be playing throughout the experience. But okay, we're six minutes into this critique and I haven't talked about the gameplay yet, which will be decisive with people in my opinion. Let's set the basics. You have a basic attack with your bat and abilities to jump as well as dash, your typical stuff. If you get hurt, you'll be able to eat food, but in battle it will take time to consume the food depending on what it is. Liquids for example are pretty quick but things like jerky may take a little bit of time. Or you could just go into the menu and eat the food automatically, although there is an option to disable that in the accessibility options. Later on, you'll also get sub-weapons like a slingshot to throw rocks at enemies, or infinite bombs, not sure why they're infinite, that both use energy meters so that you can't just spam them, but you do have infinite items for that part. So let's start with what will be the most decisive element of combat in my opinion. And also decisive in terms of the platforming now that I think about it. The dash. The ability to dash is here, but there's a catch. Momentum means a lot. If you dash and then go to stop, you will move a good time after you stop hitting the button, compared to a lot of other games in the genre. This also happens in the reverse, in particular when I noticed that I wanted to do a dash jump, that I needed a tiny bit of momentum before doing that, especially on ledges where I may have just run right off of it and didn't jump the way that I wanted to. Gale is not someone who turns on a dime, but it is pretty purposeful when it comes to the design of puzzles and enemies here. Many people may point to this and say, oh, these controls are bad, but no, it's not that the controls are bad. The controls are purposeful for the designs of enemies and level design here. Enemies have attacks that are dodgeable, but if you're using your dash incorrectly and not timing it right, you end up not having the momentum to get out of the radius of an attack, or you'll end up dashing right into one. 
If you are stubborn and unwilling to change your playstyle from typical action platformers in the genre, I would probably not suggest the play Phanatopia Awakening. The best parallel example I can think of to describe how the movement in Phanatopia affects the gameplay is to compare it to the delay on the whip in the original Castlevania. If you were to play a spastic style trying to whip everything right away and not thinking about things, trying to make your muscle memory and reflexes take over, you would die a lot in that original game. Now apply that logic to the dash here, and you've got relatively the same exact thing. Even puzzles fall into this category as well, because of the use of the dash in particular with your positioning is vitally important. Take this box puzzle section here that makes you use your bombs to destroy all of them in a time challenge. If you're not using your dash correctly and positioning yourself in the right places to throw your bombs, you'll end up failing over and over again as you overshoot certain targets or just not putting the bombs in the right places to have them blow up in consecutive turns in order to catch falling boxes in terms of a domino effect. I must admit that despite some early frustrations with these controls and taking time to get a hang of things, it was clear to me that the design of a lot of these levels felt really, really creative using the systems in place. I never really felt the game in the first few dungeons was repeating a lot of challenges either. There was a lot of variety here with the small tool sets that I had at that point. I was rather impressed most throughout my playthrough. And if you're concerned that Phanatopia is not going to give you a challenge on its base difficulty, well let me frankly dispel that thought. The game, especially for impatient players who don't take their time to survey a situation and think about things for even a second, will cause major headaches and some patented gamer rage for several out there. I died a bunch, but most of the time I could easily point to my mistakes in combat, which was usually me jumping in and not really thinking about how to take two big axe guys on for example, and then getting wombo comboed by them. Granted, there are some points in the game where I feel like the difficulty spikes at certain points. There's a boss fight in the second area that is still giving me problems as I play the game and go back and play a little bit more. That fight has some jumps that are incredibly precise at certain points and it feels like compared to the earlier parts of the game, yeah, it was a bit of a mountain compared to everything else. Now one thing I did like was the sub weapon implementation. Yeah, your club is nice and useful and it's going to be a majority of your damage, but when you're dealing with those more complicated enemies or dealing with those more complicated situations, you're going to need to pull out a sub weapon. And those sub weapons do have good strengths, but also good weaknesses. Take your slingshot for example. Your slingshot is your ranged weapon and you can do okay damage with it from range, especially on smaller enemies. It's not going to take down a boss for example, but it's going to keep you safe in terms of enemies who aren't going to come towards you. However, its weakness is that if they do decide to go at you, it does have a little bit of time in order to aim as well as not necessarily being something that can take down an enemy right away. And the fact is, is that many of the sub weapons here have that sort of caveat where, okay, yeah, bombs are useful and can do a lot of damage, but enemies can also end up hitting it towards you and killing you with your own bomb, which, yeah, is hilarious. Now, there's a good reason to explore the world as well. There's a lot of side quests with NPCs to find extra items, to get something that's worthy of a, a weapon upgrade, for example, and you will spend a lot of time looking around the world. This is an explorer's type of game, and maybe that won't work for everyone, but the fact is, is that if you do want to, you know, get all those upgrades, just go look at a guide at this point. The game is 
packed full of a lot of content here. They say about 25 to 50 hours of playtime depending on how much of the world you want to see in their press release. And given what I've seen so far, I believe it, especially with all the text that I've seen. And the thing is, is that if it keeps up the variety that it's had at the start here in terms of the level design, oh boy, that's going to be something that is going to keep you invested for only about $20. That's pretty darn good bang for buck when you think about it. I also want to briefly mention the presentation. It is very pixelated at certain times, but there is a lot of life and a lot of good animation here. When you rescue your friend and you are twirled around by them, you can really feel it. The game doesn't necessarily, you know, pop out in terms of the visuals, but it does the job in selling the moment. And that's exactly what a game needs to do with something like a presentation like this. Music is used to emphasize the moment, and really a lot of the music is great here, although sometimes the music seems to just go away at certain points, and I don't understand why. In addition, the sound design is good, giving you an idea of what you're hitting or what exactly is going on, but doesn't necessarily get in your way either. It is there to emphasize your gameplay actions, but doesn't overtake them, which is exactly what it needs to do here. Now, quite frankly, I wish I put more time into the game so I could give you guys a full review. But considering the game is coming out today on Steam, and those first seven days are very important for a Steam game, especially of this type where it's a single player experience, I felt like, yeah, I need to give you guys my opinion right now. Because Phenotopia Awakening is a great game, and unfortunately on the Nintendo Switch, where you'd think it would do pretty darn well, it was strongly overlooked. Now I missed it on the Switch, but I would implore you, don't miss it here, especially if you are a Metroidvania type of player or an adventure platformer type of player, because this game is right up your alley. Sure, it may frustrate you in the first couple of hours, and there may be a couple of points where you're like, what am I doing? Where am I needing to go? But frankly, it is worth it for the different combat, for the different exploration, and for the light-hearted yet overall nice story here. If I were to give it a score, and this is an unofficial one, I'd probably give it an 87 out of 100 right now, meaning for me it would be a solid buy. And I will put in some enhancers here. If you don't know what my enhancer system is, it is score elements that are trying to match the game for you. So the 87 is an overall score for, you know, most players, but then the enhancers try to specialize to a more subjective element, like if you like stealth games, so on and so forth. Anyway, that's it for now for this type of review, and I do want to get a lot of your opinions in terms of if this review format works for you or not. Granted, it's not something that I would do, you know, 100% of the time, but with all the games that I try to cover, especially over on Twitch in terms of streaming, I have to have more of a freeform type of video in order to cover more games on this channel, and I think something like this would work for that. But if it doesn't work for you guys, I'll put it on the back burner. Anyway, this is Dragnik signing out, and as always, keep on gaming.